Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Ambassador Roger Carstens, who is the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, and you will hear us refer to this as the SPIHA at the United States Department of State. Ambassador Carstens, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, John, delighted to be here. Glad to have time to talk to you this morning. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on, Ambassador. The conversation that I'd like to have with you today will cover your role about with um, hostage negotiations and diplomacy. But before we get into these topics, our audience would love to get your take on our strategic landscape. Yeah, most certainly. Uh, John, uh, again, appreciate the chance to talk to you about this stuff. Uh, obviously, something important to me. I spend you know, uh, 12 hours a day, it seems, uh, on this topic, usually seven days a week. Uh, the bottom line is that I have the job of leading the U.S. government's diplomatic strategy to release and secure uh, Americans that have been held hostage or Americans that are uh, determined to be wrongfully detained and held abroad. And so whether the captor uh, is a terrorist network or a government, the U.S. government needs to employ every tool we have to include creative information tools to bring Americans home. Excellent. And you've got a uh, extensive uh, career in government and the military. Do you think you could give just a moment and, and give a little bit more background? Uh, my short little intro at the beginning there didn't do your, your experience justice. Yeah, sure. At age 17, uh, wanting to perhaps solve some of the bigger problems in the world, just like I think a lot of kids uh, these days, I decided to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. I figured that uh, going into the Army would be a, a good move for someone, honestly, who cared about human rights. To my mind, the U.S. military, with the work that it did in World War II, for example, was, a, a, uh, I guess, a human rights engine of change, and I felt I wanted to be a part of that. So I might be one of the few people that joined the Army because uh, of a human rights uh, uh, background or a desire to be involved in human rights. Uh, once in the Army, I went to the 1st Ranger Battalion, uh, served uh, two years there. And later I decided that I wanted to get closer in a way to the human rights side of the army. And I joined US Army Special Forces. I think the motto in Latin, de oppresso liber, to free the oppressed, really appealed to me. And I spent the next 16 years as a special forces officer serving uh, pretty much all over the world, but mainly focused uh, on the European theater, retiring as a Lieutenant Colonel in 2008. From there, I went into uh, think tanks. I served in NGOs in both Somalia and Jordan before coming back to the state, the, the government side of the house in the Department of State in a beautiful part of the Department of State called Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, or as we call it, DRL. Uh, spent a wonderful year of my life there before Secretary Pompeo asked me to uh, take over as the SPIHA uh, and serving in the, of course, the same building, but with a different mission. In this case, the de oppresso liber, the free to oppress, the free the, free the oppressed, uh, was to be applied to American citizens held hostage or who were wrongfully detained around the world. So, even though I've kind of jumped in and uh, back and forth between government, between think tanks, between NGOs, uh, and then from the military to the Department of State, I think the thing that's always motivated me, probably since I've been a teenager, is this thought on working hard to free those who are being oppressed, who are held either in bad governments or literally being held by captors. Yeah, well, that's something. It, um, when uh, pe people get to a certain age, uh, as you and I are, Roger, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s, and it sounds like you're in about the same age group. But as you gaze back over your life, it, it almost seems like uh, there's uh, – 
there's a story to it, and it seems yeah. like you you've got this 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 helping uh, story that that really uh, integrates nicely with with everything that you've done, including your current role. So that's a that's a really uh, really lovely recap there. Um, I'd like to start getting into the Spiha role a little bit, if we sure. may, Roger. And so I understand that there's been you know some recent legislation which created the Spiha role, but it was a rather important uh, touch point for understanding the way the United States uh, navigates this whole hostage and wrongful detainee uh, dynamic going on. Do, do you think you could paint that landscape for us? You know, John, I'll do so, and I'll, I'll try to do so in a way that makes legislation kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, sure. It's, it's getting kind of difficult, but really the bottom line is that the United States uh, didn't do that well uh, in some uh, different hostage cases that occurred uh, during the early days of the conflict in Syria. And as a result, President Obama decided to do a complete review of everything that the U.S. government does with regards to hostage policy, bringing Americans back from uh, that are being held. And it resulted in some, uh, I guess, presidential level orders to include something we call PPD-30, which gave is essentially established SPIHA and established an architecture within the U.S. government to address the challenge of bringing Americans back. He also uh, put out an executive order, which uh, gave our offices, as well as some others in the National Security Council and an interagency group called the uh, HRFC, Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell, to kind of address this topic. And so we've been kind of chugging along for about five or six years with uh, the PPD and the executive order, but nothing was really written in stone. So truly, it could have all disappeared uh, because nothing was kind of locked in to the system. And Congress actually came on their own accord and passed some legislation at the end of 2020 called the uh, Robert Levinson, uh, I guess you could say we just call it the Levinson Act. Uh, and the Levinson Act is named after Bob Levinson, the longest uh, held uh, US hostage. Uh, who disappeared in Iran many years ago, uh, a great, uh, a former FBI agent, a great American patriot, and absolutely uh, totally worthy of having this act named after him. What it did is it codified into law everything that Spiha uh, and the other entities in the government charged with this mission were doing. So as opposed to uh, having an office that could disappear on the whim of anyone who comes into office, this, this uh, office is now pretty much a part of the U.S. government. We've gone, uh, I should also say that it gave us extra resources or the ability to garner resources. So I think when I walked in the office, uh, we had four people. We're now up to about 25. Uh, believe me, everyone is gainfully employed. We're not trying to build a kingdom here. We're just trying to really just do troops to task, put enough people to actually manage the workload that we have. And it also, uh, the Levinson Act also solidified the, uh, the ways that we do business, the tactics, techniques, procedures, the processes, uh, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. I mentioned resourcing, but probably one of the most important things it gave us is it gave us criteria that uh, allows us and helps us into making the determination whether a person has been wrongfully detained by another country. And if mm. I can back up for one second, I'll tell you that there are a few ways that when someone's taken overseas that we can refer, refer to them. The first is kidnapping. Mm -hmm. And that's when yeah. uh, a, a criminals, for the purposes of obtaining a ransom, take an American. That case pretty much goes straight to the FBI. Then there's hostage taking is when a terrorist takes a person and they hold them in order to compel some concession from a, a country or money, a policy change, for example, a prisoner swap. But that's usually a terrorist group like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, JNM, et cetera. Then there's wrongful detention when a U.S. national or U.S. citizen or even a lawful permanent resident is detained by a foreign government. So much so in, in, based on this criteria that the secretary of state can make a determination that this person is has been taken wrongfully based on the, on the circumstances. Mm. So the Levinson Act gave us a lot of this, this criteria so that the first time, instead of kind of going off a gut feel, we can actually look at different criteria and then based on the totality of that criteria, render a good decision as to whether someone's held wrongfully or not. And the last thing I think that it did was uh, the Levinson Act uh, codified something we were already doing anyway, but that is working with the families. So when I see my missions, I, uh, I see them really as threefold. The first is bring Americans home. The second is work with the families be transparent, partner with them, make them a part of the team, give them mm -hmm. feedback, let them know where we are. 
And the third thing is to implement the Levinson Act uh, by making sure that we keep building out this enterprise and every year professionalize it and every year institutionalize what we're trying to do here. Mm, great. Well, thanks for that recap. So it sounds like the the Levinson Act uh, uh, put like a uh, infrastructure and in some defined some swim lanes between the various different players on the on the national security side of you know who who handles kidnapping and wrongful detention or hostage scenarios so that so that you guys know you know who has um, who has the ball at any given time i guess when 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 these types of things are happening what's the difference between like engaging with a, a state actor versus a non-state actor are there rules of engagement differences on the us side you know, the one, the one thing I can tell you is that the, uh, the earlier um, numbered uh, presidential orders I gave you, PPD-30 mm -hmm. and the Executive uh, Order 13698, um, they allowed SPIHA to frankly talk to the bad guys. There's that old motto that, you know, quote, we don't negotiate with terrorists, end quote. But I think we realized that uh, there's got to be, be at least someone in the government that can reach out to the other side and talk to the hostage takers, the rogue regime, the terrorists, et cetera. And so as long as we're kind of like lockstep and aligned with the NSC and the people in this building, SPIA is allowed to have those, those discussions. Um, in terms of those conversations, you know, um, uh, give me 30 seconds to kind of outline something to answer that question. Because you'd like to say, yes, when I talk to terrorists, I, I use this playbook. When I talk to nation states, I go in this route. There, there are probably some easy to, to garner, uh, you know, rules of the road there. But I was mindful that when I took the job, I went and talked to the first SPIHA, Jim O'Brien. And Jim O'Brien said, Roger, uh, you know, I've been a corporate lawyer for many years. I've worked in government before. And I just have to tell you, there's no playbook to what you're about to walk into. Uh, every case is going to be different. They're all going to be hard. And it's, it's not like corporate law. And I said, OK, I got it. And I went and talked to Robert O'Brien who took uh, the role afterwards, the second SPIHA. And I sat down with Robert and in a one hour conversation at some point he, he stopped and said, by the way, I just wanna tell you that there's no playbook for what you're about to jump into. Um, he goes, you're, you're gonna struggle to find one, but I'm telling you, you just gotta take each case, start off tabula rasa and figure it out. And so in my heart of hearts, I knew both of them were wrong. And I figured being a soldier, if I applied everything I put into the army, I'd come up with these task conditions and standards that would allow me to come up with a, uh, a battle drill, so to speak. Just like it, you're, you're a, a Marine, uh, when you make contact with the enemy, even if it's confusing, if it's at night, it's in the jungle, you can't see, you're not sure where all the forces are, you can still go into a battle drill for movement to contact. And you have associated task conditions and standards that allow you a modicum of success, even when it's very confusing. So in the two years and four months I've been in this job, I've thrown myself into trying to get the mathematics to this job right. And at the end of the day, probably about a year and a half into it, uh, I realized that Robert and Jim O'Brien were 100% right. There is no playbook to this. They're all different. As much as I try to apply science, this is a business where the art is uh, more of the deal. You really have to do the math. You have to actually do the math. In other words, uh, come up with your plan, come up with your courses of action. Uh, in fact, when, when I get a case, we usually pull together 10 or 15 people from the intelligence agencies, the Department of Defense, Treasury, Commerce, NSC, the regionals, consular affairs. We all get into a big room and we go through the military decision making process, you know, specified tasks, implied tasks, limits, constraints, risks, risk management, course of action one, course of action two, course of action three. We're going to evaluate these courses of action based on the following criteria. The following criteria are weighted. And eventually you come up with a math to at least a, a starter point, a start point. Uh, and then once that's over, it's just what Clausewitz said. Uh, you know, everyone can have a plan until the first bullet goes off. Yeah. Or as Mike Tyson famously put it, <laughs> everyone right. has a plan until, you know, someone punches you on the jaw. And then after that, the book goes away and you, you go into this place where if war is art and science, you now are dealing with art. And in terms of the differences between dealing with, um, say, a terrorist group, we've talked to them, and a nation state, we've talked to them, there are some differences. But at the end of the day, um, just because it's a very strange part of negotiation, you in a way come at it with a, uh, a very fresh look. 
And I've, I'm, I'm mindful that every time we go into one of these negotiations for the first time, even though we are pretty certain we know how the first negotiation is going to go and what the bad guys or the other side wants, 50% of the time, we walk out of there just saying to ourselves, oh my goodness, did not see that one coming. And then you have to, just like in the military though, you know, you, you, you crash into the other side, you have to back away and quickly adapt and then go right back into battle to see what you can uh, achieve there. So in a way, uh, we approach them uh, very much uh, in the same way. The one thing I can say that I would that that does differentiate talking to the nation states is there's probably just a tad bit more of alignment. The one thing that we try to do in our office is we don't want to be uh, loose guns on deck. We don't want to be rogues who go out there and, you know, in a way, parachute into a country, solve the problem. And by the time we leave with that American, we've destroyed 10 years of U.S. foreign policy. So especially when talking to another nation state, whether they're recognized or not, uh, we go out of our way to make sure that we're aligned with the uh, regionals in the Department of State, consular affairs, um, at times the intelligence community, for sure the National Security Council, uh, the Department of Defense, Department of Treasury. We want to have some alignment so that when we go in, uh, we are staying on the policy angle while still trying to deviate a little bit off to establish a separate hostage uh, or wrongful detention channel. There's embassies all over the world, and presumably the embassies are frequently maybe the uh, first to find out about you know something happening which sure. would be which yeah. would be of interest in this area. Um, is there is there a difference between uh, discussions which are led by the embassy or uh, and and what gets matriculated to 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 your office to be managed? Do you understand what I'm asking there? Oh, I totally get, I totally get it. And, and really, it's it, it does get down into a case-by-case -case basis. Overall, there is no uh, line of continuity. We have some uh, engagements right now where the embassy is actually leading the negotiation, and that's okay. You know, the bottom line is that we talk to the people that are forward all, all day long. It's, we're on the phones all day long talking to the NSE, the embassy's forward, uh, across people, across the interagency, as we say. Um, there are other cases where the embassy is passing back information, but they're not leading the negotiation. And so we might come in or else someone from uh, a regional part of the Department of State might come in. To our mind, the most important thing we tell people when we're talking about how to address a case is we don't care who gets the credit. We don't really care if no one's, uh, if we're not in charge, we do want to make sure that we're the quarterback. We're quarterbacking what happens on the specific case. But at the end of the day, if the U.S. ambassador Ford has the relationship, he has his finger on the pulse, then he might be, he or she might be the right person to open up this negotiation. And then while we may be coordinating it back here to make sure that everyone knows the state of play, we're all counting on that U.S. ambassador to be the one that can uh, put the football into the end zone, so to speak. And on the cases where that's not happening, we're tight with the embassy to make sure that, again, when someone comes in to conduct the negotiation, or if it's held off site, for example, if we were to have a talk with the, uh, the other side in Geneva, that everyone's still aligned because the last thing you wanna do is have an ambassador forward that didn't get the update based on the chat that just took place in Geneva. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. but you, I tell you, you asked a great question because the assumption is that SPIHA, can, if, if there are like a hundred negotiations that I, Roger Carson's am conducting a hundred of them personally, when in reality, we really don't care as long as the negotiation is being conducted. And we have negotiations that are actually led by uh, the ambassador forward because he or she is in the best position to do so. I see. I'd like to transition slightly, if I may, Roger, and, and start talking about how information uh, in the information environment uh, affects things today and maybe perhaps differently than um, it affected things 20 or more years ago. So, you know, we've had discussions on this podcast about how uh, information is practically instantaneous th these days. Uh, everybody on, not everybody, 
billions of people on earth, you know, have their own publishing device, you know, some kind of a smart device where they can just tweet or send out uh, something. And uh, before you know it, the world knows about something in a way that it didn't used to be 20 years ago. Could, could you talk about how your office has, uh, you know, grappling with these kinds of dynamics? I love the way that you characterize it. I mean, um, obviously you have your finger on the pulse and I, I feel like uh, we could actually benefit from talking to you more than you, like you talking to us. But I can say that uh, w when I grew up, um, back in the days when I first got turned on by the thought of human rights, say from 1975 to 82, when I took off to West Point, I mean, we all watched Walter Cronkite, right? Or mm -hmm. we watched you know, the six o'clock uh, evening news on, on three different channels. That's all you had. And I used to read the Spokesman Review and the Spokesman Chronicle every day to get my, my daily feed of news. And now we, we go to this point where we're actually tweeting with the Taliban back and forth in mm -hmm. terms of passing these messages. Uh, we actually can deliver real-time messages through social media to the other side, should we desire. Uh, and if we wanted to move the needle on a call for a humanitarian release or set the right conditions for in-person negotiations, that's actually a tool. But, but we have to do our homework. You know, for example, uh, uh, just a, a bread and butter uh, example is that Twitter is blocked in Iran, for example. So if the department or SPIHA was interested in trying to pass a message that maybe got into Iran uh, in Farsi, we'd have to go via uh, Instagram and not, and not uh, Twitter. They also have to recognize that it, not only are there the abilities to pass these real-time messages, but there's also real-time disinformation taking place. Mm -hmm. And we have to sort through that. And so whether it is uh, dealing with countries like Venezuela, Iran, China, and Russia, we're just mindful that while message, messages can go back and forth, obviously, as you all know, the disinformation can go back, uh, back and forth as well. So in a way, things haven't changed at all. And yet in a way they have. Uh, I would also say that there are areas in rural environments, let's say, for example, the Sahel Desert of Mali or uh, places in Syria and Yemen, where maybe there isn't an internet environment, or maybe uh, if there is a hostage listening, he or she may uh, be able to listen in on a radio, but of course, you're going to have no internet connect connectivity. So it might be able, it might be incumbent upon us to come up with a way to talk to a radio station as a humanitarian gesture to broadcast in that target language, Pashto, for example, to message bystanders to keep their eyes open or to the captors to ask that the hostage be treated well and fed adequately. And maybe even a, a message in English recorded by a family member that asks that one hostage to stay strong and that you know his country uh -huh. is still coming to get him. Something that we hope can be heard by the hostage. So I would say that we are having to wrestle with this and instead of thinking that as uh, the new media environment as too hard to do or an obstacle, people like Joan and Ken are actually working hard to ensure that we can actually use these in a positive way. And whether we go from handwritten letters to using the media and communication tools that are out there in, the, in, the, in, in this space, we want to be able to make sure that we're using it for a positive uh, advantage. Right. Like, like so many things, it sounds like... Um being flexible and creative is uh, as important as, you know, understanding the very latest dynamics. Um, so, yeah. Um, how does your office uh, define stakeholders when it comes to negotiations or, you know, strategic communications is um, as much a part of your job as uh, getting getting people home safely, I would imagine. What, what are your thoughts around stakeholder definitions and communicating to the various different stakeholders? So I would say it's super broad in that I think when I took the job, we thought of what we did as a government enterprise. And I think we quickly opened up that aperture to where uh, when I think of stakeholders, when I use the phrase that we've come up with, it's called hostage recovery enterprise. Within the government, uh, that's the State Department. Within the State Department, that could be consular affairs, the regional bureaus, but outside state, it could be the CIA, Department of Defense, Treasury, Commerce, the National Security Council, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, I'd say if you were to broaden that, it could be members of Congress and their professional staffs. It could also be uh, non-governmental organizations like the Foley Foundation or Hostage US, for example. Uh, it could be into third party intermediaries like Governor Richardson, for example, or some of the great lawyers out there who do all this human rights work that can add to what we're trying to do. Most certainly, it means the family members. You know, they're part of this uh, the, the, the stakeholder enterprise. It also means members of the media. Um, 
And we, of course, we would, being part of the government, our job is to purely provide transparent information to the media. But I've been very uh, pleased to see that they actually give a voice to what we're trying to do. They will at times put out a story that humanizes a hostage, which we think is not a bad thing for, to have happen. They'll highlight the issue of someone being held. Uh, I, I, I'd be lying if I said if uh, the New York Times or the Washington Post puts out a piece on another government, uh, we'll read it and in a way try to analyze it to determine uh, maybe a little bit more in our leadership analytical profile of the hostage regime or the terrorist group that might be holding an American. So I think in terms of uh, who we think is a stakeholder, it's super broad and it might also include allies. It might include people that are not allies, but people that we still might be able to work with in order to bring someone home. So as opposed to a narrow definition, we look at pretty much anything and anyone out there in, in the entire environment uh, and that's a lot of variables as a possible stakeholder to help us either bring the negotiation or using information, highlight something that we're hopeful will either humanize a person, uh, pass a message, or allow us maybe to analyze the situation in a way that helps us come up with the, uh, the right investigative lead that helps us or maybe uh, the right way of looking at a negotiation. I'd like to switch gears slightly, if if I may, Roger, and uh, talk a little bit more about, I don't know, some of the um, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, implications of your operations. Uh, so it, it dawns on me that uh, state actors in particular must be like tr trying to weaponize uh, international norms and, yeah. the, and the rule of law uh, and yeah. kind of like hiding behind those um, those, you know, current current international norms as a pretense to other uh, ends. Like so, for example, uh, you know, the taking of hostages under the guise of law, but uh, they're they're really seeking foreign policy leverage or they're they're trying to compel concessions as you mentioned i'm i'm a marine and so i think of things like you know maneuver warfare and how yeah, this yeah. this could be like a a geopolitical maneuver warfare uh strategy what what's your what's your hot take on on, on those types of considerations so i think uh bringing your uh, marine brain to this actually has lent you some good clarity and I think you're absolutely on target. Um, they do use, other nations will use international norms as the rule of uh, law as a pretense. Uh, what, we're, what we actually find ourselves doing at times is reminding press outlets who cover hostage affairs that in a way there's no need to keep legitimizing and amplifying the false charges. So if a country, for example, takes an American and claims that this person was conducting espionage and we look into it and realize, look, this is fake. This guy was innocent. They've clearly taken him to use him as a bargaining chip against the United States. And so we'd make the declaration that he's a wrongful detainee. You know, at that, at that point, when we talk to the media, uh, we'll remind them that, you know, look, there's no need to legitimize or amplify these false charges. There's no need to like keep repeating that someone is quote, charged with espionage, end quote, when the crime is simply a pretext. That's, that's really the other government's talking point, not ours. Our point is, this person's wrongfully detained and we're trying to get them back. But boy, the other countries, a hundred percent, you're right on target. They will use this and go into battle and act as if this person actually did do some of the bad things that they were charged with when on our investigation, it's clear they're not. And I think if I can jump into one thing and maybe I'll answer this, but I'll take a bunny trail. I'll go off to the side a little bit. Um, Secretary Blinken is committed to putting an end to this practice. And I know uh, President Biden is too. And it may take a few years, but the idea is that if we can call this out and, and kind of reverse it to create a stronger international norm against hostage taking by working with our allies and like-minded countries to not only call it for what it is, but also to raise the cost of using US nationals or any human beings as bargaining chips. And our thought is if we can get a unified approach and work with other countries that can raise the cost that in the very end, we'll, we'll maybe it could be 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years from now, we'll be able to raise the price that the countries that do this will say, look, this just doesn't work anymore. Too many countries are calling us out on this. Too many countries are banding together. And if anything, they've established a stronger norm against it 
than the norms that these other countries have been trying to break through. Mm, yeah, uh, you, you know, I also just had like this flash of of of, of optimism, actually, wh while you were talking about this. I mean, I mean, this is this is very pessimistic type you know stuff that yeah, that, yeah. that we're talking about. Uh, uh, very very cynical, but. Uh, if state actors, you know, bad actors are, you know, using the current international norms, uh, you know, trying to weaponize that, at least they're still recognizing that there are international norms and yeah. they, they are participating uh, it, 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 in a cynical yeah. way. They are at least still participating in the international norms and it would be almost more worrisome if they stopped even trying to participate in international norms. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? To, to the point that I think you'll make a great spiha one day. I think that's exactly <laughs> the truth. I think you've, uh, um, the things that we talk about at like, you know, sometimes that we'll take like a, a break at like 7.30 at night, you know, maybe go out and have a beer and mm -hmm, sit around and mm -hmm. talk for 30 minutes, then go back and hit it for another hour. But when we talk about these things, um, we will we will discuss how these the very fact that these countries in a way acknowledge the international norms by trying to break them and get around fascinating to me and we try to find ways to leverage that and throw that back it's almost like we're trying to do a very high level game of bureaucratic jujitsu um i think i'm hoping and i think secretary blinken and president biden are hoping uh, and they're charged us with is creating those norms in a way that we just cannot get around them mm -hmm. and if secretary mm -hmm. blinken uh, has his way We'll disband this office uh, in 10 or 12 years because we'll solve this and thrown it onto the dustbin of history. And that's that's actually doable if we can pull the countries together and, and out, as you said, in maneuver warfare, outmaneuver the other side and strengthen the, the, the walls of, the, of these norms. I've got a policy never to do math in public, but it, it, dawn, <laughs> it, 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 it dawns on me that, uh, you know, there are like some, some real game theory type dynamics at play with the way your office navigates this because it's not only trying to get 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 the US citizen home but it's it's also being a critical player in all of this geopolitics and doing it in a way that simultaneously tries to deter uh, future behaviors like this, uh, uh, what, you know, not encouraging accidentally states to do something like this, and yeah. ti timing your messages, and and, and all this. I mean, it, it can get. Uh, I, I'm sure that there are like mathematical optimizations that can that can suggest various different courses of action. Does your office have that kind of statistical modeling capabilities in order to try yeah. to enhance decision-making? So everything you said is where our head's at. In, in other words, uh, so I'm gonna, let me hit a few targets real quick. Number one, um, those are the things we think about. Number two, we're also mindful that uh, the, this is not a business negotiation. Uh, it can be that way, but sometimes it's very primal. And that um, are the people that we go up against at times, you know, most of them didn't go to Harvard or the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. So when they when they show up to a negotiation, uh, they may not even have a very good education, but they fought their way and clawed their way to the top. And they will at times approach the negotiation from a very uh, primal sense. So a lot of the things that we bring into negotiation not only brings together uh, things from the legal field, the philosophical field, the diplomatic field, but we're also trying to remember what it was like when we were five years old on a playground and the bully came up to us or what it was like to be on the wrestling mat or what it was like to be on the battlefield um, or what it was like to be in a very hardcore negotiation with a trade union that's trying to, you know, one side or the other, that's really trying to eke out something. So you have to bring this all to bear. It's uh, maybe perhaps not as uh, uh, analogous to a trade negotiation with a European country, it can at times take different uh, variables and different feels to it. And so, so the third thing I'll say, and it really gets to the part of your question, is in terms of analytical research, there is precious little in that arena. Uh, I know when people get PhDs, they're always trying to find, you know, like if you're doing a PhD in like physics, good luck trying to find your PhD topic because everything's been written about since the 1700s. So you want to try to find that that original uh, question 
which is going to be worthy of getting your doctorate three years later. In this field, it's all open. There's been very little work done. People will say things as if they're fact, uh, like, well, if you do this and give this country what they want, they're just going to take more hostages. Now, common sense wise, that may actually be true. It makes common sense. Mathematically, no one's ever done the math. And so this, this is a place where uh, we at times will rely on the good work that some of the very few people that have looked into this have done. Guys like Brian Jen Jenkins out of RAN, uh, Joel Simon, who's written a good book on, the, on this topic. Uh, there are a few people up at the West Point Counterterrorism Center. Uh, we've had a chance to work with Harvard. But we're, we're in an area that if people were to spend a lot of time doing the mathematics, the thing that you and I hate to do, they could probably actually make some uh, very big gains on what, what does it mean to be a hostage, who's taking them, what are the incentives, and what are the ways to best solve this. Um, we try to bring everything we can to bear, but we're doing so in a field that has very little research. Yeah. All right. Well, to, to our to our audience, we'll break the fourth wall here. Uh, it looks like there's a, a, a research, uh, several research topics there for for you guys to explore. Just one more question before we wrap up, Roger. So uh, we've I've, I've learned during the course of talking with a number of people on this podcast that, uh, you know, relationships are, you know, extremely important uh, as we're navigating uh, today's uh, security climate. So what, what organizations, what U.S. organizations or agencies do you tend to uh, work with most closely? Uh, and, and what organizations would you like to establish stronger relationships with? You know, we, we work with so many, but the, I think my go-to is uh, the National Security Council. Uh, they're wonderful. We, uh, we, we're on the phone to those guys all day long. Um, I would say the FBI, we work with quite heavily, uh, specifically also the hostage recovery fusion cell, which is an interagency uh, uh, organization that deals with coming up with strategies to return hostages. So think of us. That was created as well as part of the Levinson Act, right? You got it. Well, it was, yeah, it was created under Obama in 2015, but it was solidified under that Levinson Act. You're, you're, gotcha. You've, gotcha. you've done your homework. And it's about like, I'd say like 30 to 40 people that come from different parts of the government that bring information and capability to bear. Um, so I'd say also DOJ, DO, uh, Department of Defense, Treasury, uh, the intelligence community. It's not like, I'd say we're on the phone and talking to these folks all day long to the point that I never have to worry about who I'm going to talk to at DOD because I know that person. We talk enough. And so we've built these habitual relationships. Uh, and so if someone is taken uh, as a hostage tomorrow by either a country or a terrorist group, we're not starting from, scratch, uh, from uh, square one within the U.S. government. In terms of uh, who would I like to build a better relationship, I would almost say I'll reach outside the U.S. government and just say we've enjoyed our uh, collaboration with, uh, I would say, our partner countries. Uh, could be anyone from the Five Eyes to the G7 to really just uh, countries uh, around the world that we deal with. Uh, we will always want to keep strengthening those sinews between us uh, for the same reason. When, when someone's taken, I don't want to pick up the phone and call my counterpart in France. I want to actually know who I'm talking to, say hello, ask him how his family's doing, ask him, you know, how was that thing that he was working on a few weeks ago, and then get right to business. And so we are constantly trying to make sure that around the world in different uh, countries and different organizations, we can pick the phone up and make that call and talk to quote unquote, our guy or our girl. On the Cognitive Crucible, I frequently ask guests if they could share a, a book or uh, some other online resource that, that may be related to the kinds of things we've talk, that we've been talking about, or just um, you know, what are some good, good things that are on your nightstand currently? So I appreciate that question. Uh, to get into this topic, I'm a big fan of Joel Simon's We Want to Negotiate. There are very few books on how to actually get this done. Uh, there's I, I can think of like three or four that, that kind of qualify. And uh, Joel Simon's book gets right to the heart of the matter. It covers a few uh, cases and gives uh, a few thoughts on the way ahead. And I'm a big fan. It's a short read, but it packs punch on every page. Uh, if you want to get into a personal story, I think Jason Rezaian's Prisoner uh, is a great book. He was a journalist for the Washington Post and a former detainee in Iran, spent 544 days in an Iranian prison. And he taught us a lot about disinformation and what hostile regimes do to legitimize false charges. 
So uh, that, that to me is also a go-to book. And, and then maybe I'll leave you with one that uh, you'd probably uh, expect me to bring up. You know, I'm 57, I've read a bazillion books. I have a, my second master's is at St. John's College where I did nothing but read the great books. And I'll always return to Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, the writing from, you know, five or 500 years before the time of Christ, it's still relevant today to include, uh, as if you might recall, when the, the, the Spartans were captured on the island of Sicily and how uh, they had to go through, frankly, the bargaining chip uh, argument. It's just a fascinating look at how this is a 4,500-year four, four problem. And if you don't believe me, all you got to do is go to Xenophon, uh, Thucydides, uh, go to the Bible. This We're dealing with a problem that's been around since civilization has been around, and we're going to try to crack it. And at times, going back to Thucydides and some of the old books might give you your best roadmap. Excellent suggestions. We'll put links to those in the show notes, as well as the links to the uh, various uh, executive orders, laws that uh, Ambassador Carsons was uh, mentioning during this discussion here. And with that, Ambassador Roger Carsons, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. John, I can't thank you enough. It was an honor and pleasure uh, to chat with you and your audience. I wish you a good day, sir. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.